Beloved, it's another day to worship God. I come in the name of Jesus Christ, and I say grace and peace to you and your households. We begin with every praise is to our God. Indeed, God is worthy to be praised. He has brought us to the 12th month of 2020. And today we just want to praise him because if it wasn't for his grace and his mercy, we would not be here. So I do not own the rights to the song, but I trust that it will inspire you to worship God today. Every praise is due to our God, God our Father. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today that we can say that we are your children and you are our Father. We come today in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, and our soon coming King. And we say, God, we come to worship you today. You are worthy of every praise. And so we ask, oh God, that you would send your Holy Spirit to lead us in a time of worship so that our worship would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Oh God, we pray that we'll forget about ourselves and concentrate on you and worship you. God, we thank you and we praise you and we bless you and we give you glory and honor for we pray in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Again, I greet you in the name of Jesus. I hope you're staying safe. You and your household. I plead the blood of Jesus over you and your household. And I pray that no pestilence or plague shall come near your dwelling. May God watch over you as you go out and come back in and keep you safe. Today, I want to thank you for the journey that we're on together that, and for your faithfulness, for you doing your part. I thank you. I thank you for your consistent giving. Some of us, well, some of us have been really faithful in, in honoring God with our gifts. And I say a special thank you to you. To those of you who continue to, find, what, to ask for how you can give, you can give online at Vanco. You can reach out to myself or any member of our leadership team or finance team, and you'll be given the link so that you can do online giving. You can drop off in person on Saturdays. We are here from 12 till 3 and you can mail it in by regular U.S. postal mail. And so we continue to, to do God's work in different ways. It's been altered because of the pandemic, but we continue to do ministry here. We continue to have in-person worship at 11 a.m. following all the CDC protocols. So far, God has been good, we have been safe, we have had no outbreaks, and we thank God. 
Some of our sister churches have not been so fortunate. Over 20 of them have had to close down after reopening because there were clusters of infections in those churches. As a result of that, our bishop has asked us out of an abundance of caution to make decisions regarding staying open or closing based on our locations and what's happening in those locations. We continue to open up and for worship because our location continues to do well. Our surrounding communities, they are doing better than most of the country. And so we are carefully monitoring what's happening around us. And based on that, we are making decisions. So at the moment, we continue with in-person worship. We thank you and we thank God. You know, we're trying to do some of the things that we've done in the past in spite of what's happening. And so we have poinsettias that are decorating our altars and, and you know that we'll be selling those poinsettias. So please get your, your request and your order in and your money so that you can have a poinsettia for your holidays. So thank you for that and thank you for all those who work to, to ensure some degree of normalcy. Let us pray as we dedicate the offering for God's work. God, we thank you that you are the greatest giver. You will give us all. And we thank you that you've given us employment and income. And today, most of all, we want to thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And so we ask that you would receive our gifts, our token of um, our appreciation for all you've done for us. So we ask your blessings on the gifts and on the givers. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Today is the second Sunday in Advent. And as usual, we light the candles. Today, I will light the candle of faith. And I'll do the reading for today. Our lists are long. Even in this strange mess where we live these days, and we want to do it right. We want to be safe, but we want to be able to enjoy the season. We've got work to do to put right what has gone wrong, to heal what is broken, to mend relationships, and to prepare for the scaled down celebration. The prophet Isaiah reminded us that there is work to be done. He says, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. When God comes in, then healing is found, but we need to make the way. We need to open the door into our lives. So we light this candle as a sign of our faith that the God we worship is not far from us and that we can clear the way for that God to come and dwell with us. We light this candle in faith that we will be able to have guests in our homes again. Oh, come, oh, come. Emmanuel. Amen. Our scripture reading for today comes to us from 2 Peter, reading chapter 3, verse 8 to 15. 2 Peter, chapter 3, 
verse 8 to 15. And today, first Sunday, we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper a little later in this broadcast. Here begins the lesson, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything in it, everything that is done on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved, and the elements will melt with fire. But in accordance to his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth, where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace, without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. So also our beloved Paul, brother Paul, wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Today I've titled the reflection, Active Waiting, Active Waiting. In this season of Advent that particularly highlights the coming, the second coming of our Lord and Savior, I want to talk about active waiting. It means waiting and working. So many have predicted when the end will come, the end of the world. It, it, this, this prediction of the end of the world has become quite the shenanigans. Many have gotten laughed at and mocked because the time and date that they predicted came and went and nothing happened. And so we wait and we wonder. I've often found myself engaged in conversations where we are examining current events in light of the scriptures that speak of an apocalyptic end and some of the time we say yes we see signs of the end and sometimes we're not sure and those conversations continue but there's much about life and god and how god works that we don't fully understand the text today tells us that you know at a day in God's estimation, it's like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. And so we do not quite understand, and we don't quite see God's calendar. We don't work with God's timeline, and God doesn't work with ours. The prophet Isaiah wrestled with this kind of difference between us and God, and he said, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so there's always this difference 
in our perspective and God's. This letter, 2 Peter chapter 3, this letter that was written, we're not sure if it was written by Peter. In fact, most historians believe it wasn't. But because of the standing that Peter had, the writer used Peter's name and, and some of the teachings are Peter's teachings. And so while we wouldn't argue as to the authorship of this text, it tells us that the church that he was addressing had a similar, a similar dilemma. They were trying to figure out when Christ would come. And so some members of the church were drifting into different teachings. And there was a teaching that was very much reflective of the culture that Peter was addressing or the writer of, of Second Peter was addressing. Some of them were saying that they had been freed by Christ and that such they were free to live anyhow they chose. They were free of the moral constraints that the, the early church modeled and tried to live by. And they were of the opinion that they were Christian, but they could still indulge in the lifestyle of the pagans. And so the writer of the text asked them a probing question. He said, what sort of persons ought you to be? He answered that question as well. He said, you should live a life of holiness and a life of godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming day of the Lord. He was saying that their waiting should be an active waiting. They should be preparing for Christ's return by their actions. And that would hasten Christ's coming since Christ was waiting for the church to repent and to turn and live holy lives. The writer of the epistle believed that Christ's return would be of no benefit to the church if all they did was to watch for, this, for his coming. Watching for Christ's return was a small part of the work needed to be done. The larger part was the working while they were waiting. It was the putting their, their preparation in motion. And so today I say to us, a people who like to prepare, we like to prepare. We prepare for everything. Part of the fun and the excitement is in the preparation. Somebody say they're getting married. There's a big preparation that we begin. And so we as people who like to prepare, I say to us today that as we wait for Christ's return, we ought to be actively waiting. We ought to be engaged in the preparation so that we can be ready when he comes again. The Amplified Bible says it like this. It ought to be a pattern of daily life that sets us apart as a believer and a, 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 a an action and actions that would lead us into godly behavior. And so we, we live in such a way that we exhibit that godliness, that holiness, that set-apartness as Christians, as people called to be the church. And so Advent is much more about actively waiting about for the second coming of Christ. It's about working while you wait. While we wait, we ought to be leading lives of holiness. And there's a reward. There's a reward. The text tells us we'll be at peace with God. That's one of the rewards. And the second is that we will find our eternal home in a place where righteousness will be the order of the day. So 
as we wait, we are at peace, knowing that we are doing all we can to prepare for the coming. And when he does come, we will be able to be with him. We will not have to fear. We will not have to be under the, the condemnation of, 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 our, of, our, of our sins, but we will be free. We will be able to enjoy his presence and find a place where righteousness is the norm and not the exception. And so as we wait, we wait with hope and we wait in faith. You know, the text says the Lord is not slow about his promise. So we know that God will keep his word. We know that Jesus will come again. We don't know when. And so we don't need to be hung up on when he will come. But we need to wait with confidence knowing that he will come. Because he is waiting for us to repent. He's waiting for the people of God to repent. You see, we need to lead the charge with repentance. We need to turn from sin to righteousness. It has to begin with the church. If we're looking for secular society to repent first, we will never, ever see that. We, the church, we've got to lead the way with repentance. The text says God is not slow, but he is patient, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Jesus himself said it when he walked this earth. He said, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Luke 5, 32. So it's not delay like the early church thought of it. This absence of the, the second coming, it's not a delay from where God is standing. It's about patience. It's about mercy. It's about grace. God's extending his grace to us, giving us time to get our house in order, giving us time to repent from our sins. So Jesus is, so if Jesus' delay is as a result of the church's slowness to repent, you might ask, what does the church need to repent of? Truth be told, the church has become a social club. In it, most of the people have not received salvation. In it, our function and focus is more on coffee hour. It's more on, on doing programs that have nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church no longer teaches about sin and repentance and, and holiness that much. We've become politically correct. We have been going down the wrong path. Many of us teach prosperity gospel and we focus on food pantry ministries and, and, and those things are good things. We all need to, to be giving and we all need to feed the hungry. But if that is our main focus, then we've missed the mark. And we need to repent and turn around. We need to practice works of mercy equally with works of piety. We've got to focus on, on holiness and salvation and repentance again. That's what John the Baptist preached out in the wilderness as he prepared the way for Jesus to come and, and, and to, to minister to the people. He said, repent and be baptized. And so when the church turns from that club mentality and that social club mindset and turn back to the gospel, that's when God will see that we are ready and Jesus will come again. And so the church needs to repent for not doing what it has been mandated to do spread scriptural holiness preach the gospel that's what the church's main and number one focus ought to be 
The prophet Hosea once told the Israelites to turn back, to repent and turn back. He said, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. And that's the message today for the church. Return to the Lord your God. That ought to be the rallying cry of all the churches. And, every, and, and hear me well. When I say church, I'm talking about the church universal, the Christian church. We've all strayed from the message. We've all gone off track. And we've got to get back on track. New Testament professor at Luther Seminary, John Frederick said, and I quote, The biblical call to live a sanctified life, a sanctified holy life, is a positively crucial truth with eternal consequences. We are not justified by faith with an option to sign up for the additional holiness package. Rather, we are justi justified by faith in order that we might have access to a transformative relationship with the Holy God. End of quote. How does such a person live a life of godliness and holiness? How does the church live out a life of godliness and holiness in this time that we are in? This transformation that Frederick is talking about is born out in our daily life. How we think, how we speak, how we, how we act. And as a church, we ought to lead the charge. We ought to lead the way. We ought to stand out and stand apart rather than adapt to the popular culture. Because when we lead the way with repentance, the world will follow. The community will follow. But we have got to lead the way. And yes, we need to repent as a nation. Yes, we need to repent as a community we ought to be leading the way so that these different sectors of our society can follow suit but we seem to blend in more than stand apart and we have not placed a premium on holiness and godliness i'd rather we try to be politically correct and turn a blind eye to ungodliness and immorality and wickedness the church has got to return, return to the altar of God in humility and confess that we have, we have gone wrong and repent of our sin. And I want to talk now about the rewards for holy living. Remember I said there's peace and there's righteousness. We will have peace while we wait for the second coming, knowing that we are doing all that we can to lead blameless lives. The text says we should be without spot or blemish when Christ returns. And righteousness, when you're living right with God, it's compatible with peace. You feel at peace because your spirit tells you that you're going on the right path that you're doing the right things and you're thinking the right thoughts and you're saying the right things. Righteousness is compatible with godly peace and peace is priceless. It is priceless. So we must be diligent and we must make every effort to be found by him spotless and blameless in peace. That is this inwardly calm, this sense of spiritual well-being and confidence, living a life of obedience in Christ. The Christian trying to live out in this way is going to be facing challenge and ridicule and rejection from fellow humans. We talked about this in Bible study on Thursday. How we sometimes we lose friends because we chose to walk with God. But that's okay. Because when you lose humans, you gain the best friend ever, Jesus Christ. And you're rewarded with being at peace 
a peace that you will never find in this world. You know, the writer says, when we are doing all of that and Christ comes, we can expect a new earth. We can expect new heavens, a place where righteousness is at home, a place where righteousness dwells. Do you like that picture that he's painting? of a world that will be at peace, a world that will be right, a world where right living and right being is the norm and not the exception. A place where we can find people who are like-minded in, in righteousness and holiness and where we will all act right and talk right and treat each other right. I can, I sure look forward to that. A world that everything is at home with God. A world at peace. In the book of Revelation, John paints a picture as well of this new heaven and new earth. John says, then I saw a new heaven and new earth for the first heaven and earth have passed away and the sea, and the sea was no more. And then he says, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride for her husband. And you know what the brides look like. Beautiful, immaculate, fashionable, pleasing to the eye. And then he says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, see the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them. That's the new heaven and the new earth. Friends, we have a lot to look forward to. We have a lot to expect and to see. We have work to do as well. A lot of work to do as we wait for God to send his son back. We've got to start though with repentance. We've got to start with repentance and move to right living. Move to, to live, to strive to live right. Because we're never gonna get it perfectly, but we can work towards perfection. It's a challenge, but we can do it with God's help. And when we do, we will experience the peace of God. We will know that our guilt is gone and we can eagerly look forward to that promise of a new heaven and a new earth where God dwells. May it be so. May it be so. May it be so. Let us turn to the Holy Communion Liturgy as we prepare to celebrate our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I hope you have your elements ready. I have mine. And we will share together. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another therefore let us confess our sin before god and one another merciful god we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart we have failed to be an obedient church we have not done your will we have broken your law we have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us in silence confess our sins to God. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. 
In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them for us, the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit, with your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Take and eat the body of Christ given for you. Amen. Take and drink the blood of Jesus Christ given for you. Amen. Let us pray. God, we thank you that you have fed us in this holy mystery, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet prepared for all humankind. Amen. Friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and you and give you his peace this day and forevermore. Amen. God bless you and see you next week. Stay safe. Stay covered under the blood of Jesus.